Hey, Kino? What you doing in there, big guy? It's art, Ian. I've covered a lot of weird movies on this channel. I know that more than anybody else. I've discussed a coprophagia of Sallow or the 120 Days of Sodom, the extreme violence inflicted on genitals and Antichrist, the kind of fetishy material in Doug Walker's The Wall, and the of a Serbian film. But never have I discussed a movie in which a woman sleeps with an octopus monster. That's right, I'm an anime YouTuber now. Hentai, actually. I'm just kidding. Today, let's take a look at Possession, a film I swear is not hentai, despite the fact that an octopus monster and a woman get it on. Before I begin this episode of Shocking Cinema, I wanna say two things. For one, I'll be covering some dark content and talking about adult themes, so viewer discretion is advised. Also, I have a Patreon, and on that Patreon, I will have an uncensored cut of this video. So if you wanna see that version, a link to my Patreon is in the description below. Possession is a film that divided audiences upon its release in 1981 and still divides audiences today. It's a movie unlike any other. It's got this pulsating, chaotic energy to it, and every actor in the film gives over-the-top performances. It goes against what we think a good movie should be. It defies what is considered normal or correct, and it certainly defies labels or genres of any kind. It's a movie that won a top award at the Cannes Film Festival, yet was sold as a video nasty in America. It's kind of an undefinable, one-of-a-kind film. I think what you want to do to Bob is... Inhuman? So what you're doing must be human. To really understand the film, we need to understand its director, Andrei Zuwowski, as the movie is actually quite autobiographical. No, not the part about the octopus monster. The part about the divorce. Zuwowski got his start in the film industry as an assistant to Andrei Vida, who was and is probably the most famous Polish film director of all time, who also wasn't caught in bed with minors. <clears throat> Polanski. Vida helped Zuwowski start his career as a film director by assisting him in getting Zuwowski's first feature film, The Third Part of the Night, off the ground. If you know anything about Vida, you should know that his style is nothing like Zuwowski's. According to Zuwowski, Vida admitted that he really didn't get The Third Part of the Night, and it wasn't his kind of movie, but he saw this upcoming director as a young, interesting voice who should be cultivated. Zuwowski ended up marrying one of the stars of that film, Malgrija Tabronik, and their later divorce would serve as the primary inspiration for Possession. His next film, The Devil, was absolutely crazy. It takes place in 1793 amidst the Prussian invasion of Poland. A mysterious man frees a prisoner, who is set to be killed as punishment for attempted regicide. That man then takes the prisoner, Jakub, back to his hometown to show him how his fellow conspirators turned on him, as well as how the society had degenerated into utter depravity. With a small knife, Jakub commits a string of bloody, gruesome murders. But is he acting out of righteousness? Or is there something else? Something more sinister at play? You can tell that the devil came from the same director as Possession, as he employs that frenetic camera work and has the actors all engage in that highly physically expressive mode of acting. There's even a scene that feels like a predecessor to the famous subway scene from Possession. It's a movie that definitely falls into the literally me genre of films, but Poland wasn't having it. The movie was outright banned. It wasn't banned because of the gratuitous nudity, graphic violence, or incest scenes. No, it was banned for its themes of political dissent. Afterwards, Zuławski wasn't too popular with the Polish government, so he jetted off to France for his next feature. The most important thing is love. That film's story is about a love triangle in which the woman falls for a man who is not her husband. Ironically enough, at this same time, Zuławski's wife left him for another man. The film won him international acclaim, so he was able to return to Poland not as a political dissident, but as a famous and beloved film director. He would find this newfound love, or acceptance, short-lasting. His next venture, On the Silver Globe, would prove to be his most ambitious project to date, as well as a source of his downfall. Zuławski turned his lens from smaller, more personal stories to a story about humanity at large. As the plot of the film is about a group of astronauts who crash land on an alien planet. They set up camp near the sea and cultivate a new tribal civilization. In time, the tribe sees the founders as gods. But all goes wrong when a group of adventurers cross the sea and find a decaying civilization of bird people called Shurns. The Shurns enslave the humans and breed an ungodly race of half-Shurn, half-human people. Later, another astronaut, Marek, crash lands on the same planet and on the same mountain as the original astronauts. He descends from the mountain and the tribe welcomes him as a god. He slowly accepts his role as god, and attempts to free the people from their Shurn overlords and, in the process, becomes a Christ figure. 
It's a film bursting with ideas and provocative imagery. I describe it to my friends as like, what if Terrence Malick decided to make some weird sci-fi movie? That's on the Silver Globe. However, for as great as it is, it's still an unfinished film. After 18 months of shooting, a censor from the Ministry of Film shut down the project because he believed the film to be anti-communist. He had all the sets burned and all the costumes buried. Everyone was fired from the project and the Polish government blacklisted Zuławski. They made it so that not only could he not make another film, but that he couldn't ever work again in Poland. They wanted him destitute and dead for this perceived dissent. The government's public statement about their reasoning for shutting down the movie was that the film was over budget. Zuławski, till the day he died, swore that he never went over budget. I'm inclined to believe him. But now, he was without a family and he was living in a nation that basically wanted him dead. He was at the end of his rope. And if things had not happened as they did, he might only be a footnote in the history of Polish cinema. Thankfully, he had a way out. Poland was hurting as a country and needed people to bring in foreign currency. Zuławski had some producer contacts in France who wanted to assist him, so they were able to get Zuławski out of the Eastern Bloc and into the West, where he would work on his next film, Possession, with the writer Frederick Tutin. Zuławski and Tutin wrote the script for Possession in New York City and initially had Sam Waterston attached to the role, but they ended up casting Sam Neill after seeing him in the film My Brilliant Career. They wanted Isabella Johnny for the part, but her representation shot them down. However, she was in dire need of a big break, as the French film industry had effectively blacklisted her for being difficult to work with. However, Ajani had a son with Bruno Nitten, who just so happened to be the cinematographer for Possession, so he helped convince her to come onto the project. And thus, the exiled director and the blacklisted actress teamed up to create a film that would define both of their careers. Possession, at its core, is a breakup film. It's about Zawowski's divorce from his wife and his divorce from his country. He incorporated many real and personal moments into the film, such as when Mark finds his son alone in the apartment with jam all over his face due to Anna's neglect, or how Mark discovered that Anna was cheating on him with some new age guru guy. That aspect of the film feels real, but the delivery is over the top? I'm not sure that that is actually the right way to describe it. It's definitely expressive. It's theatrical, but also cinematic. It's big, but also nuanced. The actors aren't acting this way because they're bad actors or they're high or anything like that. Believe it or not, that acting and directing style is grounded in Polish acting theory that began in the mid 20th century. There was a theater director in Poland named Jerzy Grotowski who directed his actors to express everything on the pages with their whole body and voice, which leads to very expressive performances. There's much more I could get into with regards to Grotowski and how important a figure he was for experimental theater. But for today, I'll just say that Zuławski saw a production of Grotowski's when he was young, and that colored his view of how actors should act on film. He wanted to take some of what Grotowski was doing on stage and adapt it to film to make it cinematic. So. The acting and crazed expressions in Possession are entirely deliberate, and not a result of bad acting at all. Zawowski noted that it was kind of difficult to get the actors to go along with that style, as it can easily make them look like fools. I know this style isn't for everyone, but I love it. I think it highlights the emotional truth of the text. If you've ever been in a deteriorating relationship, like the one that Anna and Mark experience, then you understand all their feelings. You also understand that your perception of an argument might make that argument seem more intense than it actually was. You could have been talking at a normal volume, but it felt like you were screaming at each other. In Possession, Swarovski externalizes that internal world. Their perception, how skewed as it might be, manifests itself as their reality, or at least a reality that is presented to us. Case in point, during one of the fights, Mark takes the electric knife and cuts the top of one of his arms a few times. Why? To get pity from Anna? Maybe. Maybe to feel closer to her, as she herself is cut. But the next day, the cuts are gone. This could be a goof in the film, but it could also be a result of an unreliable protagonist. We see what Mark imagines doing, or an expression of his feeling in that moment, rather than what actually happens. The colors of their world also show us their states of being. The arguments and fights happen in their cold, blue apartment, whereas Anna rediscovers her passion in her yellow, rundown place in Kreuzberg. Their emotions express themselves through the colors of the physical objects around them. Their relationship, and thus their breakup, is something physical. Mark goes through a long period of illness and delirium upon realizing that it's over between them. When Anna slaps him, he then asks her to do it again. The physical contact, though violent, excites him more than any screaming match could, as between them, words are meaningless, and their physical relationship has become something sickly and perverse, where they can't really enjoy making love to one another, but they can certainly beat each other bloody. Well, he does most of the beating. This anger, resentment, and evil also physically affects Anna.
It grows inside her like a tumor, a cancer that she can't control or a demon child that is growing in her womb. She must excise it and that exorcism, or I guess it's also maybe a miscarriage or birth perhaps, is the most famous scene in the movie. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Are you a programmer who's making something that's anti-establishment, anti-big tech, something that's open source, something that doesn't treat the customer like a product, something that can change the world? Well then here at Fudo, we have a place for you. We're starting our 2023 Spring Fills program, and what does that entail? It entails at least $20,000 per engineer, accommodation here in Austin, office space, equipment, anything you might need. So if this sounds like something that interests you, I'll leave a link to where you can apply in the description and pin comment below. Now, back to the video. <laughs> <laughs> For this scene, Zawowski instructed Ajani to quote unquote fuck the air and captured all of it in one long take. She gyrates, writhes, and flops around the subway as if in a trance. Side note, she was kind of in a trance. As preparation for the film, Zawowski had the actors go through sessions in which they were hypnotized and put into trance states. In this scene, she pulled from that experience she had in those sessions, supposedly. At the end of it all, blood and some white liquid streams out of her, forming a puddle on the ground. Off screen, according to the script, it mixes with dirt and sand, forming a kind of golem that will eventually turn into a doppelganger of Mark. She released the evil from within, but now it's something of its own, something living, something she truly cannot control. The director likened this to speaking evil, that once an evil thought comes out through one's lips, it is no longer of that person, but of the world. Who knows how other people will react to that now uncontained thought? Will it die a fast death, or will it become a mind virus, leading the people who happen to hear it down a dark path? There's a blatant political message behind this. In an interview, when Zuofsky spoke about speaking evil, he referenced communism. It's no coincidence that he set the film in Berlin, with a lot of the locations being right next to the Berlin Wall. He wanted the film to be filmed as close as possible to Poland, and Berlin ended up working perfectly, as it was like a western island behind the Iron Curtain. And he presents communism as a great evil in the film. We know this because Helen, Anna's doppelganger, explains to Mark that where she comes from, they can look evil in the face. I come from a place where evil seems easier to pinpoint because you can see it in the flesh. She, as we know, is from East Germany. So what he's effectively done by setting the film in West Berlin is surround Anna and Mark with a kind of physical, overbearing evil. Evil is all around them, and it's always drawing closer. It's only a matter of time before they become victims to it. There's another angle to this evil, though. In a film that Heinrich makes, Anna conveys her existential crisis by talking about faith and chance. It's like the two sisters of faith and chance. My faith can exclude chance, but my chance can, can, can explain faith. In a way, the miscarriage scene was a miscarriage of her faith. She embraced the absurdism of chance in her life, and that faith that left her turned into her new god, but an evil god, a nihilistic one. Her religion, her worship of this golem is unholy and carnal, but we'll get to that in a second. He's very tired. He made love to me all night. And this evil festers and grows in Anna's Kreuzberg apartment. It grows into that abomination that looks like something from The Thing. I want to point out that Carlo Rambaldi, who made E.T., the aliens from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and the alien from Alien, was also the man behind the monster in possession. It could have been a very different monster, though, as the puppet he brought to set was, no joke, a giant penis monster. Zawowski described it as a gigantic pink condom. He had to add some arms and whatnot overnight to make it work for the film. Anna leaves both her husband Mark and her lover Heinrich for this evolving monstrosity. She becomes its protector, killing anyone who might discover her secret. When Mark walks into her apartment and finds out the truth, that evil envelops him, possesses him. Right after that evil takes him over, the camera racks focus to the communist side of the Berlin Wall. He kills Heinrich, burns the evidence of Anna's crimes, and then becomes a protector and co-conspirator of Anna. They leave a trail of carnage in their wake as they try to save the golem. This is also when Mark walks in on Anna f***ing the octopus monster. I've got to admit, 
The first time I watched this film, I thought this scene would be way more graphic and gratuitous than it actually is. I was surprised by how artful and restrained it was, definitely more toned down than the manga. This trail of destruction ends with Mark bleeding out at the top of a spiral staircase, and then Anna and Gollum approach him. And that is when we find out that the Gollum is Mark, or a new, different version of him. He and Anna stand there, radiant, until bullets pepper her body. Finally, ideal duplicates of both Anna and Mark are made. Helen is everything Mark wanted, feminine, sweet, a good homemaker, and attentive to Bob. Mark, then, must be everything Anna wants, which I think is someone who is around, someone who pleasures her, and someone who she can take care of. Their old, broken selves die together on the staircase, while Mark's duplicate ascends to the apartment to unite with Helen, fulfilling his destiny. Bob, scared, screams to Helen to not open the door. Does he sense the doppelganger's bad energy? Did the doppelganger fail Bob's vibe test? And just as he unites with Helen, we hear sounds of war. Bombs, planes, and sirens, implying communist forces are invading West Berlin. It's as if their act of unification fulfilled some divine prophecy to trigger Armageddon. West Berlin, the symbolic bastion of good or decency or at least a place where evil is abstract, is finally corrupted and overtaken by a very real evil. What happens to the golems? Does Bob drown in the tub? Has the apocalypse begun? Zawowski leaves us with way more questions than answers at the end of the film. There's the explanation that involves evil, but there's a separate explanation, I think, if we look at the scene focusing just on the relationship between Anna and Mark. Their old selves die, we'll say witness Mark's ideal self, well, Mark's ideal self for Anna at least, before them. They see how they could have worked. If only both of them were just slightly different, more perfect for each other, then they would still be happily together. But that's not the reality. They weren't perfect for each other. The relationship fell apart, and with their deaths, the relationship dies with them. It's like, you know, when after you break up with someone, you might have a conversation about what went wrong or how either of you could have salvaged the relationship. I see this scene in a lot of the movie as being like that kind of conversation, but told cinematically. Mark and Anna get a bittersweet ending. They come to understand each other, and they finally know what they needed out of each other the whole time. They kiss and embrace one another, showing that they still love each other, even if they could never last as a couple. Possession released at Cannes in 1981, winning Isabella Johnny the Best Actress Award, which effectively unblacklisted her from the film industry. The movie divided critics and audiences, with some people fervently loving it and some people absolutely hating it. It had a not-so-great run in American cinemas, so the American distributors tried their best selling it on home video as a video nasty to make some profits. They marketed it as a horror film, which I guess makes sense, but the really egregious thing they did was make a recut of the film. They cut out about half an hour of the movie, re-edited it sloppily, and redid the audio track. They butchered it. I wonder how many people back in the 80s saw that version, and it forever colored their opinion against the movie. The film had legs, though, and any film as unique and compelling as Possession deserves to live. It became a cult classic, and now there's like a whole section of film Twitter where cinephile girls have Anna as their profile pics. If you want to know what happened to Zawowski after this, he spent the rest of the 80s working in France. He would only return to Poland in the mid-90s to direct Shamanka, which actually might be an even crazier film than Possession. He's a director who has a style unlike anyone else, and a whole bunch of great movies in his body of works. If you like Possession, I would highly recommend checking out his other films. He deserves way more recognition than he gets. Oh, and by the way, there's a new 4K restoration of Possession, but I prefer the older HD restoration as it seems like they messed up the color grading in this new 4K scan. The scan that Mondo used on the Blu-ray is the superior one, as its color timing was approved by Zawowski and looks closest to how it looked on its original theatrical release. I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video. Leave me alone, I'm watching porn! <laughs>